Just a couple of daft questions and then I'll give it to you guys. But it struck me that the whole story that we've had about gravitational waves is the, the idea is 100 years old and it's taken us 100 years really to develop a technology that is only involved in getting rid of background noise. <laughs> and that's really the t how we, we have done it. Right. We've now just got to the stage where we can detect gravitational waves. Is it then really the next stage, the most important stage, is building more detectors rather than building more sensitive detectors? It's both, actually. Again, because they do different things. The network of detectors, they, if we, and we want them actually to be of comparable sensitivity so we can combine the data usefully, that's giving us the positional information. Um, uh, and so that's one kind of information. But to be sensitive to more events in the universe, we need more sensitive individual detectors. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a mix of both. But it's, I mean, it's both. an astonishing technology that has been developed that you can measure something that's like a fraction of a proton yes. in, in, in size. I can't think how you could make it more sensitive. There are things, again, that we're looking at. So. Uh, the mirrors in these instruments, I said thermal noise, the fact that every molecule is at room temperature and shaking, there's thermal energy causing vibrations. Mm. One way to reduce that would be to cool the mirrors, to cool them down to cryogenic temperatures. So there's a whole set of research trying to understand what material could we use and cool down very quietly to make these mirrors cold and reduce that noise source. So there's a whole set of different technologies looking at those what things. What about the arm length? You've got four kilometre kind of maximum. I mean, could, is it practical to go beyond that or do you get sort of uh, other problems around? You could go a bit bigger. And again, yeah. people are starting to think about that. 10 kilometres. Um, maybe you could go to 40. But mm. there are different challenges actually that start to crop up as you make the arms longer. The earth starts to curve. And so you have to fight the fact that you've hung your mirrors as pendulums. And you know if you hang a pendulum, it will point towards the centre of the Earth. Yes. So if the Earth starts to curve and you put those two oh, pendulums gosh. far apart we'll and you try and shine light between them, you then have to correct for that. So there are, there, there are different sorts of limitations that can come in there, but again, Four kilometres is not the maximum. I think we could think to make them longer, and that is, again, one of the obvious ways to make the detectors more sensitive. You need a different planet, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, the other thing that struck me is the, the, te the technology, not the technology, the, the, um, the philosophy behind it is very similar to, in one sense to dark matter detection, where you're trying to pick up what dark matter particles are, but you can't do it because you're constantly bombarded by other particles yeah. that are whizzing. So you, but you stick it at the bottom of mines and you yeah. build all sorts of things to get rid of the yes. background noise, yes. which is what you did. Um, but what can you also add to the... Do you think you will be able to add anything to the, the, our understanding of dark matter because it has a gravitational effect sure. after all? I think it's, it's, it's hard to say what, what we would, could contribute to the dark matter side. I mean, mm. people are thinking about that. Again, there are, um, not us, but different experiments from the dark matter community trying to detect dark matter particles, yeah. I actually think that is going to be one of the next big exciting things that, that, that we could, big discoveries to come is, is, is from the dark matter community in terms of dark matter detection. For gravitational, we, but we don't know what dark matter is. Again, yes. it's one of the mysteries. And we're only at the start of detecting gravitational signals for, from the universe, so I'm going to remain an open, mind, an open mind on that, again, of who knows what we're going to see, but I think it's not obvious how, how we would detect gravitational signals from dark matter. I think yeah. that community has a whole set of dedicated experiments that they're going to do there. We, we talked a little bit earlier on about Einstein, we famously predicted gravitational waves, but yeah, he, wasn't, he wasn't that confident, was he? he yeah, of, yeah, he, yeah. Uh, it's an interest, the whole field has an interesting history in terms of um, the existence of gravitational waves. And some people believed that they were actually a kind of mathematical construct in general relativity and were not convinced they would have a physical effect. Yeah. And that's why Hulson Taylor, the Nobel Prize 
there was so important because what they showed was that um, the, the behaviour of that binary pulsar system was absolutely consistent with gravitational waves being produced. Do you think Physical without, evidence. Sorry, uh, sure. Do you think without that discovery, you might not have gone, gone on with quite the, the kind of uh, enthusiasm that you have done in the community? I, I don't know. I think that clearly, again, was a, was a, it was key, actually, in actually the theoretical community because mm. people were still arguing back and forward. There's actually a book... Um, called Travelling at the Speed of Thought by Daniel Kenefick, who wrote a lot about the history of, of the controversies in, uh, in, in terms of gravitational waves. And the binary pulsar um, uh, was very important in consolidating in people's minds the reality of, 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 of gravitational waves. Right. Great. Well, thank you. And I'm going to throw this one out to... to well, your hand was up there like a shot. <laughs> Can I just say questions... Not some observations, specific questions, if you don't mind, and, and the briefer the better. Thank you for most excellent lecture, Professor. There's one thing that's conspicuous by its absence, and that's the mention of those little characters called gravitons. To what sure. extent are they relevant? So, so it's a very good question, again, for the other forces, the other three fundamental forces, they all have their own particles associated with them. And people believe that associated with the gravitational force, there should be the graviton, the, the equivalent particle for the gravitational field. And so it's a bit like in electromagnetic waves. You have photons and electromagnetic waves. You have gravitons and gravitational waves. But the energy, when you do the calculation of, of, of individual particles, make gravitons, would be very difficult to see how to detect. So by detecting gravitational waves, we're detecting effectively what you could think of as many, many gravitons, but we're not going to show the particle effects this way. Again, it, so it's a, people believe from the symmetry of the universe that there should be gravitons, these particles associated with gravitational waves, but we're not going to be able to determine that particle nature here. But it's, again, one of the reasons why we need, we need more good young people studying physics to unify those four forces and, and come up with this complete theory of, of quantum gravity. We're not in that regime. We're working really in the wave regime. Question there? Sorry. Hello. Thank you for a very informative talk. Uh, my question is, um, you know, we've, we've detected gravity waves from two merging black holes, and that's from here, and then we're planning on a space detector. But what about finding gravity waves here on Earth? Is that possible anytime soon? So the, the, the LIGO detectors here on the surface of the Earth will detect gravitational waves produced far away coming into us. But it really is source, sources um, far, far out in the universe that we're going to detect gravitational signals from. Now, there's gravitational wave, as I move my hands around, I'm making gravitational waves. I'm denting space-time just a tiny little bit, but so small, anything we can do locally here, is the effects are going to be so small we won't detect those. It needs huge masses, strong gravity. And the only sources we can think of that will um, produce gravitational waves strong enough to detect are astrophysical sources far out in the universe. We'll detect them here, but they're going to be produced far out there. What about supernova? I mean, what, what, what would they... Supernovae, that's a, a really exciting science target mm -hmm. um, to the... the rates at which supernovae occur within the volume of the universe that we are currently sensitive to yes. is not very high. So we could be lucky and, and one will happen within the sensitive range of our instruments. But they are one of the drivers partly for wanting more sensitive instruments. As we make our detectors more sensitive, we can detect signals from further away and increase the chances of seeing something like a supernova. So a supernova is not, not at the moment sort of within the kind of observational... They could, again, if we had a supernova in our own galaxy, Again, we could yes. potentially see that. But it also depends exactly what happens in the collapse of the core of the star. If it was a spherical core that 
that was completely spheric, completely symmetric in its collapse, we wouldn't get gravitational waves produced. It's because gravi gravi gravity, gra it's, we need a changing mass sort of distribution um, that's asymmetric. Right. So it would have to be, and people don't know. We simply don't know what happens when that core collapses and how symmetric or asymmetric it might be. So there's quite a lot of uncertainty in there, yeah. but it's a, it's yeah. uncertainty is one of those exciting things that again we can help answer potentially yeah. with our observations. Yeah. Scientists aren't, don't like things that they expect. What you want? That's the unexpected. That's the fun of it. Yeah. yeah. That's the fun of it. That gentleman there. Thank you. Um, 40 years ago, there were lone pioneers who had lumps of platinum and they were trying to detect gravitational waves from their oscillations. It didn't seem to come to anything. With modern technology, could it have done or was it always going to be a blind alley? So this is the bar detectors. So the bar, there are actually, I think, I think there's at least still one bar detector still operating. And uh, bar detectors Again, the supernova sources that we talked about were the ones that I think were of particular interest for the bar detectors because they are narrow band in their sensitivity and they were designed to be sensitive about a kilohertz or so. And that's the frequency at which we think, again, supernova core collapse might, might have its signal centered. Um, the, there, many of the bar detectors stopped operating partly because these kinds of detectors are broader band and we could see a way to make them uh, more sensitive over a wider region. Um, but still, I think there's at least one bar detector, I think still operating, and if we have that supernova, you know, potentially, but for, these, for, these, for this broader spectrum of sources, I think they, they were not targeted at that, they're quite a targeted uh, development. But they really kick-started the field and were very important for that reason. Thank you. Um, two basic questions about the interferometers. Uh, the first one, is the frequency of the laser important? And I'll just I'll do the second one. The second one is, do the arms have to be exactly the same length? Or does you, can, can you just know the difference in the lengths for, to, do, to do the calculation? Sure. So the frequency of the laser <coughs> is, is important for a variety of reasons, one of which is the sensitivity of the instrument is a function of the wavelength of the light. So it actually does come into the, to the, uh, the sensitivity of the instrument because we're using the wavelength of light as our measure. Um, the, ex the arms aren't, in fact, they don't have to be exactly the same length. We are looking at, we're looking at length differences, but of course we want the detectors to be large, so we want to make both those arms large. Um, but we are not measuring the DC difference, so it's, it's a hun it, we're looking at 100 hertz or so, so we're looking at differences in the, the lengths of the arms. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if I was reading your charts wrong when you did the detector on the, on the black holes colliding. Was all of that over within a second? Did I read that correct? It was. Two it, massive black holes and it's all over like that? The bit that we were sensitive to, I think, was uh, 0.2 seconds. So we caught the very fine... I mean, it, looks, it was slowed down you know, in the model that I showed, but we caught the final part, just that blip at the end there, as the two black holes, the last few cycles, they spiralled in to merge. So, and that's because that happened in the sensitive part of our detector range. Um, of course, the, the, the modelled signal I showed you, they'd been spiralling in for a, for a long time. That just, we weren't sensitive to that part. But again, it's, it's to test general relativity, it would be interesting to see more of the signal. Again, we get different information from, from different parts of the signal. But yep, it was, it was over like 1.3 billion light years away and then it passed by us like that. Bad, is it? Where did gravity and those other forces actually come from or like originate from? You know, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a question I think People for the other forces, the other three, back in the early universe, people have models for what happened and how those forces and the particles associated with them 
sort of arose in the early universe, um, gravity sort of stubbornly refuses to be integrated into the picture. Um, but that's a hugely interesting area of study is the cosmology and trying to see back to the early universe when all the physics that we have now, all the stuff we have now, sort of arose from, from a sort of early soup of, of, of things. Um, we need more young people to, to work on those very problems. In Glasgow. In, in, in Glasgow or elsewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm broad in my church. So, more questions? Can... Upstairs, here, oh, I can't, sorry. Up on the balcony. Oh, the, oh, we're up in the gods there, are we? Yes. <laughs> Could you pass a Excuse microphone? Me, can, can you see me? Maybe it's not necessary to see me. Um, well, I can hear you, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> we can hear you. Um, in some of the write-ups on the ah, uh, gravitational waves, much was made of auditory signals yes. that were used in the detection. Could you explain how that kind of information interacts with the kind of systems you were talking about? Yes. Yes, in fact, the the the... Signals here, we don't get a picture. You'll show, I showed you this trace, this wiggle. So it's not like a, an optical telescope or some of the other telescopes where you get an image. What we get is the shaking of the mirrors in the instrument. And that is something, again, uh, in the days before, you know, on MP3 players and CDs, when people had record players, you had your record player pick up and the needle vibrated and you, you plugged that into your speaker and, and you could hear the, the vibrations. And so if we take the vibrations of our mirrors, again, if we take that signal that we detect, you can play it through a speaker. Now, these particular signals, if you try and do that raw, you don't hear so much, so we, we can shift them slightly and actually slow it down a little bit because it's over so quickly. And that, I think, is, is what, what, what people have, have played. And you hear this, whoop, and, and it's a very characteristic noise. Again, the signal gets faster, so it rises in, it mm -hmm. rises in pitch, it rises in frequency, and it rises in amplitude. And so we can't, it's, it's, in some ways, it's like listening to the universe. We don't get a picture. We sense its vibrations, and we can turn those vibrations into sound. Ooh. Can we have a little follow-up on that? Sure. Because it's un somewhat unusual, I would think, that auditory signals serve in a sort of to present convincing evidence of a new phenomenon, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so can you tell us a little bit of how that actually worked in, in convincing people that these Gravitational waves were, in fact, really well. I think it's not so much the audit. It's not so much the fact that we can turn them into sound. Again, it's it's it's. I mean, it's it's. It, you're right. It's unusual that we can. That that is our. Yes. W that we have the ability to do that instead of taking a picture and image we see with our eyes, we take a vibration and turn it into sound that we can hear. But the, the, the bit that's convincing, I think, that really convinced people we had seen something was that signal looked exactly as it should in both instruments. So, so I, the, 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 I think I showed you the plot where you saw that signal and it appeared first in one and then in the other. Um, again, the right characteristics in both instruments sort of coming in. And it was that, I think, that was so convincing to people that one, we, we had good models for what the signal of two black holes colliding might look like, and that we saw that, that trace in both, both instruments. Um, I think it's just, it's just interesting that we can, we, can, we can turn that into sound. The ear turns out to be an, 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 a different way we don't usually think of as experiencing something like this. But you would think that it's more of an illustration? Then? Yes, I think so. It's really a, it's, it's, an, it's an illustration of how different this technique for studying things is. It's just a very, you know, very different way to study the universe, is to feel its vibrations rather than, than, than look up and see what it's, what it's showing us. I mean, you didn't just discover gravitational waves. You, that detecting those gravitational waves made a discovery. That's right. Well, that's the most astonishing thing. It is. It's, it's the fact that we, it was not just the detection of gravitational waves, but the start of a new way to study the universe. For the first time, we've been bathed in these waves in the past, but we just haven't been able to detect them before. Gentlemen there.
Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I realise that you probably don't work at LIGO, so you may not know the answer to this question. LIGO started taking data on the 1st of September, and in 14 days they had picked up the colliding black, the colliding black holes. Did they then every fortnight pick up colliding <laughs> black holes, or was it a total fluke? Um, Good question. <laughs> so the... the the data that's been analysed so far is, is all in the published paper. And in that, you'll see there's the one event, and I think it was 16 days worth of coincident data that, that's there. There's the, the one event that we declare as a detection, there's one data point above the background that is, is you know, statistically could be, uh, uh, is, could be noise, so we, we can't claim that as a detection. The remainder of the data, there was more data taken, again, but beca because this event occurred, people stopped, mm -hmm. took that data, analysed it very, very carefully, and that took about six months to, to do all the checks. So the remainder of the data is still being analysed again. So we don't know, again, yet what we can, we can say about that, People are still looking at that data and checking that data, so we'll just have to wait and see. And is it still, det have, have they not resumed detection? Um, no, the, the, the detector was turned off in January, and since then, I think it was January, and then uh, we've been working on um, improving the sensitivity of the instrument. Uh, with the aim of starting again a bit later this year. Again, it's like all things, it's the first time you turn a, an instrument on, um, it turned on again and was more sensitive than, than the first generation of these, but yeah. not at design sensitivity, and that wasn't a surprise, that was expected. And so there was always a schedule of taking data, turn the instrument off, make it, it's like the Large Hadron Collider. Right. You take data, you turn it off, make improvements, turn it back on. So it was scheduled to be, to be turned off. I just got this idea that it wasn't working, and somebody said, well, you tried turning it off and turn it back <laughs> on again. <laughs> If only it were that simple. <laughs> uh, regarding the actual signal itself, uh, how do you get so much information out of it? Uh, my understanding is there's like an archive of different signals for different events you should observe. How do you know this one is two black holes of that specific mass and that distance and so <laughs> forth? Sure. So the, the, there is a template bank. We have all these models for what that signal should look like for different masses of black holes, different combinations, different spins. And so there's a whole, a whole set of these templates that people can compare the data with effectively. That, that's what happens. People cert, use these templates to match against the, the potential signals in the data. And so if the black holes have different masses, different spins, um, the exact um, evolution of that whoop again, is, is slightly different. The final amplitude might be different, the, ring, the, the sort of ring down as the black holes merged. So the exact shape of that signal would be different for different, uh, pair, different masses, different pairs. So there is a template bank and people computationally run that against the, the, the data to look and see. That's, that's one, one um, good way of getting out um, the, the properties of the individual holes. To make a detection, again, people uh, run those kind of searches, the, and that works for those pairs of star systems or black hole systems. But of course, something like a supernova, we don't have a good model for what a signal might look like. We, just, we don't quite know, except we should look the same in both instruments. So they are, there are different um, algorithms that people use, different computational techniques that fundamentally look for excess sort of power in the two in, in, in the instruments. And so if there's a blip in one, is there a blip in the other at the, at the right time delay for it potentially to be a signal? Then just looking at that, one would go back, look at what the shape of the signal looked like and start to you know, look and see if that's a plausible candidate for some kind of event, whether it's two two black holes, then look on a template. Does it not look like that? Does it look like something else? And that's, again, where some of the excitement, I think, will come mm -hmm. in, where we see signals and we don't actually know where they've, they've come from, you know, to, to, to who, you know, who knows what's produced them. So, so it's partly template-based and it's partly 
looking for coincident events. And again, the more instruments we have, the more confidence we can have in terms of detecting things. Not just if we have two, if we have a third detector, again, that, that also increases your confidence that you've made, you've made a real detection. Your question up, you're pointing, I think. In your PowerPoint, you had a graphic of how a mass can have an effect on fabric, essentially yes. in space-time, yep. in, but in two dimensions. Surely now we cannot look at space-time as a single two-dimensional fabric and in, multiple, in even more dimensions to get a more effective model. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right. Of course, it's a two-dimensional representation because it's easy, it's easy to picture by analogy what's happening. But you're right. It's, 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 it's um, distorting all of space kind of round about. It's just quite hard to visualise that sort of on a slide. So we show it in 2D because it's easy to picture. But in truth, of course, no, it's, it's, it's 3D. Some question over here. And time. Said, uh, Oh, right. Get it in a minute. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Hi. I was um, wondering if there's any, between us and the event that you're measuring, if um, any of the bodies in between would, like, cause any changes to the wave. And if you could maybe study any of those with that. So... On, on these kinds of distances, probably not. I mean, one of the interesting, th one of the things that makes these experiments hard is that gravity is very weak. Um, that's both good and bad. Because it's so weak, it means it's difficult to, to detect the effects. But it also means, it, because, it, because the waves interact with things so weakly, but that also means they interact weakly with anything between us and the event that produced them. So one of the nice things about gravitational waves is they arrive with us pretty undistorted from whatever produced them. And, and unlike electromagnetic waves where dust can ma mask optical signals, however, on very long distances, again, there may be some lensing effects where, 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 where it might get distorted. But I think on this dis I bet, but on this, this distance scale, I think uh, I'm not so much. Well, probably a really stupid question, so I, 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 but is there any connection between, well, apart from scale, the Higgs field and the gravitational field, or are they completely separate? They, it's, it's, they are different, again, and I, I won't go around the loop, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it is different than, than, we can't connect the physics in an easy way. They're different, they're different things. I mean, obviously, they're all in some way related to the picture of gravity, but not in an easy way. Oh, hello. Um, hi, I'm here. Hello? Yeah. No, down here. Down here. <laughs> oh, 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 there we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you, you say that gravity uh, travels at the speed of light. So if the universe is expanding, is there a sort of gravitational redshift? So there's the, the, all those things have to be built into the built into the studies. Again, I went to a talk, I think, a public talk by Jan Eleven in the U.S., where she said again, it's a worry that, that the universe is expanding and accelerating in its expansion because everything's rushing away from us so fast. One day we won't be able to do astronomy, and that's why it's really important we do astronomy now in Glasgow. <laughs> uh, question. If we were very close to one of these events, could we actually feel the gravitational waves? And if so, what would we feel? <laughs> That's a, good, a good question. Again, I think, uh, I think we would not want to be terribly close to two black holes colliding. <laughs> I think the distortions um, in, in space at that point in space and time are so huge, I think it would be quite an unpleasant place to be. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, up here? Hello? Um, is there that any from? prediction oh. that... Hello, sorry. Yeah, is there sorry, any, <laughs> you're not there, I believe you. Is there um, any prediction that gravitational waves would interfere with each other? And if so, is there any way to test that? So, I think you can imagine if there's two waves, uh, they, they potentially could interfere. I think we're in the position with the ground-based detectors, even with the sort of rates that I talked about, that that's just not, not a problem for us to worry about. I mean, interestingly, 
uh, for the space-based detectors, there are particular sources where they could be difficult to separate out. There's what's called a confusion limit. Um, I think from white dwarf binary systems, uh, there'd be so many that they actually could form a noise background in the instrument. I think we're, we're not in that position with the Earth-based detectors. Though. 